Most of the time we interact with the ocean, it's, it's on it. We're either sitting in our kayak or a boat, we're fishing, you know, we're looking at it. We're, we're quite useless in the ocean. Even the most expert of divers can only stay down for short periods of time before we have to come to the surface again. Our planet is 70% ocean. We're not really planet Earth, we're planet ocean. And it is responsible for over every second breath you take. There's a lot going on in our ocean and we know so little about it. We know more about space than we do about our ocean. I know it's not a competition, but it's actually a really important thing to consider. See you, Brady? That's it. It's just in front of us. Yep. Hundy meters. Up, low, up. About 11 o'clock. The Hauraki Gulf, Te Kapu Moana, Te Moana Nui Atoi, is New Zealand's only marine national park. It has its own act of law to protect it. It's a really dynamic space. It's a shallow coastal embayment. It's only about 50 metres deep and it's it's really productive environment. It has warm surface waters but cold waters that come underneath across the seabed and mixes with the wind. This place is home to around 25% of the known seabird species in the world. It's also the home to around about 20 species of, of whales and dolphins with year-round populations living here. It's a really productive environment and can support a lot of life. When Māori arrived here, it was a very different place to what we see today. There were many, many seals, there were a lot more birds, there was a lot more life, there was a lot more fish in the sea. And it's changed quite dramatically as we've developed this area. We're in the early phases of changing our view of the ocean from a 2D vision that we have to 3D. And we're actually able to use a lot of space technologies to help us understand life beneath the ocean, that 3D space that animals live. We're now able to use large unmanned drones to survey the whole gulf. We can then take this imagery and using artificial intelligence, we can understand and audit all of the visual imagery we have. So we can take the sounds of, of fish, of kina, of whales, seabirds, that make noise under the water to communicate with each other. And then we can overlay this acoustic information with our visual information. Then we can take environmental variables like sea surface temperature, um, time, season, all kinds of you know varying influences to understand all of the drive of why the big animals are where they are in time and space. In the past this has taken us hundreds of hours to go through every piece of footage but now these tools that are used mostly for space science can be used to understand environmental science. 36 degrees, 30.654. Our work must be able to scale. You can fly around or drive around the Gulf for hours and hours and see nothing, and then suddenly there are these aggregations of many different species feeding on prey in the same spot. We'll be able to use small drones to look down and understand what different species make up that, that feeding mass. We can take water samples from the sea to understand the smell of the sea, a cue that many animals use to find their prey. We'll be able to sample phytoplankton and zooplankton to understand the beginning of the food chain. And we're going to use all of these different tools and techniques to understand the whole gulf. Satellite imagery is able to show where areas of productivity are, where the phytoplankton are, and we will use that to predict places where we might be able to find prey aggregations and all these birds and sharks, whales, dolphins feeding together. The thing that's really important is that the Gulf has changed a lot and we want to make it a better place than it is currently. To do that we need to be able to understand the drivers and to predict what might happen especially under scenarios like climate change so that we can protect and improve the Gulf in the future.